and I'm hitting okay. Good morning. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Sunday of the Sleepin'. Uh, I'm so excited to be here today with Jennifer and Dwight. Hi, guys. Hi. Hello. And where are you joining us from? We are just outside of Richmond, Virginia, in Bon Bonnier. Okay. And so uh, what time is it there technically right now? T technically 12, you know, 12 noon. <laughs> okay. All right. But it doesn't feel like it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, well, happy time change, everybody. Yeah, happy time change. And and thank you to everyone who's who's been participating in the sleep in this weekend. Um, it means so much. And this is our 10th year of doing the sleep in. I can't believe it. Um, and it's also our biggest fundraiser of the year. So thank you for those that are participating in the fundraising online um, and all your great pictures and uh, watercolors that you did yesterday with uh, uh, Tatiana and I. We've just been having a great time with you guys. So um, I hope everyone's enjoying the sleep in. And we're really excited today uh, to talk to Jennifer and Dwight about the Museum of Sleep. Uh, and I have, a, you know, a little bit of a background in art history. I was an art history major in college and mostly just a huge love for art and culture. And I have just been a super fan of the Museum of Sleep and uh, what Dwight and Jennifer have been working on. And so really excited to have them share with you guys today. So, um, you know, just, I just wanna ask you guys, you know, how did all of this get started? What is the Museum of Sleep and how did you get started with this? Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm gonna take that part because Dwight does the heavy lifting in so many other places. Uh, Dwight is trained as a film archivist and studied history and spent a lot of his career working with home movies, but home movies as kind of an entry into history and culture in, in the immediate. And just how, how things are seen in everyday life. And he had he had worked at a museum very early in his career and kind of always said, you know, I'd like to have a small museum of my own in the future, but we didn't know what that was going to be. Um, I'm a, I'm a pediatrician who's trained in working with kids with disabilities and at some point looked up and said, oh, you know, a lot of, a lot of my patients are having problems with sleep. Maybe I'd better do a sleep fellowship too. So stupidly signed on for a few more years, which I think was actually a really good decision. Um, I had been, I had been thinking about this. That, how did you recognize that your patients were having sleep issues? Mm -hmm. <laughs> because I, I think that's so intuitive in a way, because I guess I, mm -hmm. I think we hear often that uh, young people get miss, you know, um, mm -hmm. down other paths. So how did you re kind of recognize that people were having sleep issues? It, it wasn't subtle. <laughs> if it was subtle, I would have missed it, but I had, several patients who I still remember over the years there was kind of the girl who had intellectual disability and she could not wind it down to go to sleep for love or money she was basically you know racing a track in the carpet where you could see where she'd been pacing and running so much and kind of going why isn't she sleeping how could she avoid <laughs> sleep so much and kind of getting into the other side of the child who was overweight and inattentive and did that test we call a sleep study kind of going back over and going well I don't know this looks normal but her we don't know that her sleep is normal is this normal what is normal and there wasn't there wasn't a lot of teaching at the time and maybe there still isn't in residencies and fellowships about sleep um but at some point, we kind of looked up and looked at each other and said the three magic, three or four magic words, the Museum of Sleep. And I've, I've had a lot of stupid ideas over time, but this one kind of stuck. Mm -hmm. And 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 um, yeah. is there a museum? of? So there's, you know, there's a as lot of museums. What kind know, of museums are out there? Funny you should, Sonny, you should ask, Dwight. The uh, yeah, just yesterday we found out that there's a museum of snoring in Germany uh, that were uh, now I'm really excited to see it was uh, a collect a doctor who had been 
working a lot with sleep apnea and have been, you know, getting equipment or, you know, CPAP, artifacts. artifacts and uh, decided to open a museum. So that is, <laughs> that was a revelation this, literally this weekend, yesterday. Thanks, Dad, at <laughs> breakfast Be yesterday. Because otherwise there wasn't really anything out there, which we were a little bit surprised mm -hmm. to find out when we first started talking about this there's a museum of sex in new york why isn't there a museum of sleep somewhere so I mean, we have a museum of broken hearts out here in los angeles yes <laughs> and you know everybody many of us have broken hearts but all of us sleep at mm -hmm. some point mm -hmm. the the original concept was this this was very literal we wanted and still want at some point to have a physical museum place and do exhibits and my gosh, when we first talked about this, we've still got lists somewhere of all of the different exhibit ideas, and it was just really exciting. Um, but I think some of that's going to come up over the course of talking about what has become a virtual museum concept, the the Instagram, which is kind of the shorter form and the things that may or may not hang together, but they're intriguing and they're funny and they're, I don't know, occasionally heartbreaking. <laughs> Dwight, I'm going to let you take over. Okay. Yeah, so it, it is it is still still our goal to have a physical museum. We probably shouldn't have called it the Museum of Sleep right off the bat, but that was well, it was an aspirational idea and it, hey, it's a way to dream, always You got to dream so, big. Why not? Exactly. Yeah. Yes, exactly. <laughs> it's to keep us focused on, you know, what is the dream. So we will we will in the meantime we'll be doing both both the virtual but also more and more kind of in person events and projects and so on very cool well, I'm just excited to see what you guys have to share. And just um, shout out to everyone that's tuning in. We have a great audience joining us. I see Laura in Columbus, Ohio, tuning in. Hello, Laura. And anyone else, please share where you are joining from. It's really fun to see. Uh, and Laura, I also know, is a great artist as well. So mm -hmm. um, so do you have, do you want to pull up your slides? Yeah. And speaking of artists... You know, one of our one of our trial balloons after talking about this idea was really to put together a and this is our this is our logo. We're very proud of this one. Dwight, I'm gonna press the buttons if you wanna be the mm -hmm. uh -oh. and good morning. There we go. This is this is our mission statement. We did do one of those as we were thinking in a museum direction, just the sleep is sleep is for everyone and we want the museum of sleep in whatever form to be for everyone. The four keywords there, history, science, art, and culture of sleep, because mm -hmm. we wanted to have as, as many different ways of looking at sleep as possible. I'm going to apologize because the buttons are going a little slowly. This was our this was our initial in real life exhibit called Submerged in Sleep after a Heraclitus quote. And this was an exhibit looking at different photographers and a collection of snapshots that were all sleep themed. Um, lots of different ways of looking at sleep. I'm gonna let Dwight talk about this, but this is kind of the long view of the gallery in Scott's edition in Richmond where we put this on. Um, it you can't see it very well, but one of the we have another picture of it on the ceiling. You can see a sculpture, which is a bed's hanging suspended upside down. I'm gonna. That is so cool. I didn't notice it, that before. It would. It's much. It's much cooler in real life. Unfortunately, I don't think the pictures do it justice. And while we're looking at this view, you can see the bed on the floor mm -hmm. back there. What what you can't see from this angle is we had uh, prints on the back wall from Ted Spagna, who I'll talk a little bit about uh, in a second. But we also print, printed out or had printed um, a sheet. Duvet. Uh, yeah, a duvet cover with one of Ted Spagna's um, images. And so that's that's laying on top of the bed. I think that'll be more fun when we actually talk about Ted Spagna. <laughs> I'm going to move forward because this button's real slow today. And so just quickly, here's examples of all of the contributors to the exhibit. Um, on the top left, that's Emma Powell. She's from Colorado Springs. 
And we, she does these beautiful images, not of dreams, um, but they are, she, uh, she remembers stories that her father told her when he was putting her to bed when she was a child. And she makes, she makes these really dreamlike, but uh, beautiful images of those, a lot of cyanotypes and the, uh, be, um, or just printing techniques. But, but there are a little more metaphors about the challenges of insomnia and falling asleep. How do you how do you connect with that big animal that is that is sleep? One of the decisions we made pretty early on in talking about the concept of museum of sleep was to not have this become the museum of dreaming. And no no offense to people who are really into dreaming and dream interpretation, but that's not where we wanted to go because then things get very mushy. So we'll deal with like the physiology of mm -hmm. sleep, the science of, uh, um, I mean, of dreaming mm -hmm. and how it relates to sleep. But dream content uh, is outside of the scope of anyway. Go go to the Ted Spagna yeah, picture. Yes, so the top, top middle. That's Ted Spagna, the, the late Ted Spagna. We were working with his estate um, and his relatives. And what he did, he would he would set up a camera um, above beds. Um, he would go into people's apartments and homes, and the, his camera was set up on like uh, those like a tw I think it was a twenty or thirty minute cycle, mm -hmm. and so he would photograph their entire night, um, and, and you know their movements in their sleep. Um, and then, so this is you, this is only four, but you know obviously this whole series would would have been many pictures over the course of the night. And then he ended up working with uh, a sleep scientist so that it was, hey, it started out as, you know, an artistic project, but then, um, you know, incorporated the scientific elements of uh, circadian rhythm, rhythms and, and sleep and REM sleep and so on into that. We think of sleep as being very static, but with Ted Spagna's images, you get into kind of the dynamic sleep, the you're not just in one place and in one phase. I'm not sure if people can see the Mike Messiah picture very well because of the because of where the images are. So Dwight, do you want to go down to maybe the lower left corner? Yeah, the bottom bottom left, that's that's um Antonio Balfo, who is from New York City. He did a series for the New York Times magazine where he would go on to or subways and airports and uh, take candid photographs of people sleeping in public. Um, he found that the one place where it's where it's easy, relatively easy to find people sleeping is is you know when they're in in motion when when they're in you know uh, in transportation. So um, we. Uh, exhibited that on a digital screen because he had so many pictures to to show, and we wanted to include all of them. Um, and then middle and middle I just center. Have to, I just have to add. I know I'm nodding my head, and I am sure some of our viewers as well. Um, when you live with a sleep disorder, <laughs> it's it's been interesting to realize that some of the only places where it's like socially acceptable to mm -hmm. actually sleep mm -hmm. in public are more like on planes and. Oh, yeah. um, and in the subway, because that's where other people are also sleeping, you know, so um, it's mm -hmm. always been a comfort to be on a plane to me because then it doesn't, I'm not um, out of the ordinary mm -hmm. and I can just mm -hmm. take a nap and not seem unusual. So mm -hmm. I'm sure some people will. I, I love that series, though. That's so cool. Yeah. Um, I will go back to the Michael Messiah on the top mm -hmm. right. Um, those He took those pictures of strangers sleeping in public in Central Park because that's one of the other places where people fall asleep is when they're just relaxed, relaxing in the park. So he did, um, <laughs> his, his images are very artistic, um, very large prints. This one is extremely dark, but um, <clears throat> again, public sleeping. And then the middle um, or bottom center, that is from F Flora Hanatillo. She's a, she's an artist in Brooklyn and she invited friends and family or she, she went to their homes and she photographed them as they slept. So private sleeping, but um, uh, but but being observed by her. So there's, there's yeah, again, more some, mm -hmm. some beautiful, beautiful images there. And then you've got the snapshot collection, which is a lot more 
it's not posed, it's all very spontaneous and in the moment, then family members. Yeah, so that is from the bottom right, that's from Square America, which is a, he is a um, snapshot, historical snapshot collector from Chicago. I've been a big fan of his his collection and his Instagram um, for a long time. So we asked him to, to select several dozen of his collections of snapshots of people sleeping. <laughs> and so we included a bunch of those. As you talk about this, I just realized even how much more work went into putting something like this together than I was even initially thinking. I was somewhat initially thinking about getting the space in Richmond, Virginia, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you know, um, all that. And now just realizing, I mean, this must, how was it like months and months of our years of work to get all, all these uh, works and permissions? And well, we had a bit of a timeline because in some ways, the easy part was the space. Thank you to my sister, Claire, who at that time had access to the space. But we had a deadline, so. I think we we told them, or they agreed to give us the space. That was in February, and we asked to, to start the show in November, which was a lot more time than we probably needed. But since we had never done this before, we wanted to. We wanted a lot of time. Um, they helped us out a lot because they uh -huh. they were regularly doing shows. But we wanted to pick just a kind of conventional gallery exhibit because that's something that people understand. You know, they go into a go into an art gallery to look at art, and the people and we were not in we were not inventing the wheel by by uh, doing an art exhibit in a gallery. I'm going to move to the next. So this is this is a these are a couple of other pictures of the mattress works by Chiara Pellissier, who is a Richmond based artist, although where did she move to recently? She right? recently moved to Spain. She was Richmond based at the time. Um, I do think that this looked much more amazing in person, but you get a little sense of the scope of being underneath this sort of suspended and reflective bed surface to um, kind of get you that mirrored effect yeah so she like over inflated the mattress and then painted it with this very you know reflective chrome silver silver cover and then the image the image on the right is called tick she had a, she had actually done that bef uh, at a previous exhibit in the same gallery and so we asked her to bring that again so it is also you know just you know over inflated um and made this look like a you know a tick kind of uh, kind of all of the feelings and experiences and stories that go into your mattress mm -hmm. and was this heavy to um hang on hang on the ceiling yes, yes. <laughs> yeah she got very heavy she got several people and uh <laughs> brought in ladder ladders and uh did, did you take some pictures of that process yeah that yeah, was... she, yeah she did a video of oh, that yep. of, yeah oh that's uh, so yeah, cool pulling it up to the ceiling so i know we've done some really cool art projects during the sleep in but um mm. <laughs> the inflating of the mattress and mm -hmm. uh, all that we have not <laughs> For, for some for some reason you know mattresses don't usually live on ceilings and it was <laughs> much more complicated than you might think um we have a few physical collections and i'd say the things that we have to share here are samples not the whole thing this is kind of thinking forward again to when this is a physical museum so these are things which may not have been on the instagram yeah, so we're not really concentrating on building collections, but you know, it just happens. Even though I'm a hoarder, and I we, j we just find stuff, a, a lot of stuff on eBay, um, and just every once in a while, we'll just, we'll just find something cool and we decide we have to buy it. Uh, so our first category that we're showing here, we have a small collection of recordings, um, just as examples. Golden Slumbers, that's that's a that's an LP, that's a vinyl LP from. Uh, Smithsonian's Folkways record label, and it's a collection of lullabies. I've started to do some research and hope I'm hoping to write in the future on lullabies and the connection between music and sleep and how people use music to put people to sleep. Uh, the second, the sleep re relaxation. I didn't even, I already thought I was your biggest super fan, you guys, but that would be so cool. I can't wait to read that. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. 
I love it. Sorry to interrupt. Um, <laughs> no, he's been um, working really hard on this. Yeah, no, and, and interrupt any any time. Um, the Sleep Relaxation, that's another album from, I think it was from the 60s, also on Smithsonian Folkways label. That is more, that's this Dr. John P. Sykes, and he's, it's like... Spoken word. Yeah, it's a spoken word kind of relaxation album. Is that like an early Get Sleepy? Yeah, it's kind of like an early version of with all the podcasts to help you sleep now. Um Next is this. I just bought this on a whim. A long time ago. This is a seven inch single by Martha and the Muffins called about insomnia. I mean, there's there's a million songs about sleep. So but I, that was the first record that I had noticed that had insomnia in the title. So I went and went and went and bought that. Um, Max Richter's Sleep, that is a CD box set. And that's we use that for the soundtrack for the exhibit. And so several years ago, he developed this long piece. It's about, I think it's, a, it's about eight hours long. And he's performed it several times overnight in various, the, the various. This is not a coincidence. Yeah. And so it's designed to, you know, be played to live audiences as they're kind of going in and out of sleep. It's, it's, it's a really, you know, beautiful music. Kind of, kind of ambient electronics, but also you know orchestral or um, instrumentation. So, I'm usually annoyed by things that are new agey, and I love it. It's really, it's really beautiful. And we used it as the soundtrack for the Submerged in Sleep exhibit. So basically, if you had happened to come see that exhibit, you would have walked into the gallery, heard Max Richter in the background, the sort of long form, very relaxing music, seen the. Um, seen the photos seen the sculptures um we had we actually had some lavender wafting in the background just to try to get a smell into there we could have put a few tastes and touches in there that would have been ideal part of the it, it wasn't totally multi-sensory but we're trying to go in that direction mm -hmm. We've got a few photographs, not a lot. Um, at top left, that was one of the prints that was that was created for the exhibit. And um, uh, since we paid for the print, we get we got to we ended up with a collection of Flora Hanatijo's prints. Um, the two snapshots, um, I would really love to develop a snapshot collection of our own. That would those be fun. just those just happened to be the first two that I found. The bottom left I found out just it was for sale for me on um, an antique gallery had a collection of they had stuff for sale out on the sidewalk in Baltimore. So I found that top right I found on eBay. I just I don't know. I really like, like that image a lot. Mm -hmm. um, bottom right. Um, where so Nathaniel Kleitman's name is going to pop up a lot today, which was kind of intentional, but I've used him, used him a lot in the in the instagram pictures um um probably most people don't know who he is he he did the first really kind of in innovative but important uh, experiment into you know sleep with circadian rhythms and so on so he and his, his graduate assistant Bruce Richardson they went into Mammoth Cave in Kentucky and without any of the you know external uh sight givers yeah that's sight sight givers those they're called the yeah, light givers the light or, the mm -hmm. light cues things that would give your body a signal about when to be on schedule, when to wake and when to sleep. Yeah. So that was that was a, you know, a really important experiment that got a lot of publicity at the time. Um, and, and so at one point, they, he allowed news photographers to come in and take pictures of them. And so we have now um, we have now purchased three vintage news photographs of the two of them in Mammoth Cave. This was the first one we bought and so, gave it to gave it to Jennifer and the museum as mm -hmm. a Christmas present a couple of years so ago. So you'll notice I wedged it into the fanciest possible frame I could find. And there's actually a little engraved plaque on there too, because why not? <laughs> Um, and so can you just remind people what they found uh, when they were in the cave? I, I mean, wasn't it kind of like that our bodies keep a 24 point? Um, right, eight? that we that we have a natural cycle, but it's not exactly 24 hours. And if you take away all of that external stimulation, 
you're going to tend to spiral off a bit. Um, it's it's pretty fascinating. Yeah. What they found, well, what the what the results were was that um, um, Kleitman, who was older, I forget how old mm -hmm. he was at the time, he could not. He could his body did not adjust to uh -huh. a, a different schedule at all they were trying to make it like trying to switch them to a 28 hour schedule mm. his body actually refused bruce richardson who was i feel his pain was younger and there's some speculation that maybe is because he was younger or maybe that was just his own physiology but he was able to alternate his schedule mm. a little mm. bit a little bit more mm. Wow, it's so interesting. I just have to add some comments here from Facebook. Yeah. We have someone saying, I'm a sleep researcher in the DC area, loving the picture of Kleitman's cave experiments. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, and Tracy, who I know lives in uh, uh, in that area, she says, Mammoth Cave is awesome. Mm. And uh, Laura wondering if you're currently accepting new sleep art. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I've we, talked to them a little bit about this before, which is that there's yeah. limited space. It's not like um, you have a space right now, really. So it's kind of like mm -hmm. your house, right? <laughs> yes. Right. Yeah. And and again, I tend towards the cluttered side to Dwight's we will, dismay. But yeah. yes, we will make room. Yes, that's <laughs> um, 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 the Instagram is really, really um tends to focus a little bit on history and that just was because my own personal bias mm -hmm. i mean my training was going to be mm -hmm. as a historian as a, and working in historical museums so i just love history but but no the intention for the collections and for all of our work is always to include both historical and contemporary mm -hmm. views of sleep and and things that are not just objective but very subjective mm -hmm. So bring bring it on. We're interested. I'm going to flip ahead and say there are a few physical artifacts. And uh, I think my favorite of the group is the one that's first. But can, Dwight, would they, you like to? Okay, no. No, they can't say nothing. Okay. 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 We'll show you later that uh, uh, that is the it's a it's a dollhouse version of the Great Bed of Ware, which is um, it's been called the most famous bed in the world. Um, it was mentioned by Shakespeare, um, and it's uh, it's just huge in, in real life. It's huge. It's uh, on on display at the Victoria and Albert Museum in England. And I will be very proudly holding up my tiny bed of Ware when we're all back on screen. <laughs> So yeah, we I mean we've started there are a couple of books that we've got on the history of beds. So mm -hmm. yeah, we 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 would like to do more with beds and pillows and so on. Well, we'll we'll come back to the pillows in more yeah. detail in a little bit. Yeah. So we bought this game Sleepwalker, which we have not <laughs> unwrapped and not played. Uh -huh. So I so I Wow, can't I've tell never even anymore. heard of that. Yeah, there's a I bought it on eBay. I I I think there is one for sale on eBay now, but um it's kind of a Rube Goldberg contraption, which I'm a little afraid to touch, honestly. I think most sleepwalkers don't get into quite as much trouble when they're moving around. But. Yeah, so it's kind of, I mean, it's kind of like mousetrap where you got to put mm -hmm. this thing together and then this this little guy walks around, walks it around it somehow. Oh, my God. So when is this from? Um, 770s. Maybe late 60s. Uh, yeah. You think? It's, okay. Mm. Yeah, it wasn't around for very long. <laughs> um, bottom left, just on a whim, we, there was a there was a box of um, sleep and dream related sheet music. So, so I bought that. So we got you know several dozen or yeah, just, I don't know how many dozen um, so cool. songs, songs. My um, my grandmother was a big band singer. Uh, and Ooh. so I have a lot of her old uh, sheet music and I, and I just oh, love wow. that kind of stuff. And I love singing. Mm -hmm. I grew up singing her songs. Um, mm -hmm. So I would love to see some of that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Be interesting to find some of those recordings too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The last one, which I'd kind of forgotten about until I got it out this week, is the Sleeping and Resting, which is a, uh, um, a film strip. 
by National Geographic with the audio cassette. So I got to get that. I'll get that digitized and get that up mm-hmm. on Instagram soon. If there you was ever anyone with your could... with your background in film, you know, mm-hmm. we got to they're going to see some more film and sleep stuff. Oh, yeah. yes. Oh, yes. And there is there. I have put stuff on Instagram, um, including some film clips, which we decided not to show today, just in the interest of time. But but yeah, I'm always almost always looking out for film related or sleep related films. If there was ever anybody who could get something digitized. It's this guy. Okay. Well, the library. Um, oh, you picked a nice highlight. That was yeah. Awesome. <laughs> that, yeah. That was that was honestly one of the first books we bought specifically for the museum, and uh, I recommend it if to anybody who hasn't read. I, I yeah, I really learned a lot about narcolepsy through through your um, through your book. Mm-hmm. The other one I specifically wanted to include is the sleep solution um chris by chris winter he sent us that and the his other book um autographed or signed he lives not very far from us um so i wanted that to include that as a way of prompting anybody in the audience who wants to send us their own books or any books because this is this is what we're spending the most money on is is (laughs) developing our our library We'd be spending a lot of money on books anyway. Honestly. <laughs> yeah. That's my fault. Um, if I were going to highlight one of those books that you didn't mention, I would look in the lower left-hand corner at Sleep Demons, which is kind of part of my personal origin story in sleep. Um, the subtitle is an Insomniac's memoir. I'm not sure it's still in print, but it's it's a book by a guy who had insomnia and basically wrote this book looking at all of the different kind of sleep science adventure stories like Kleitman and Asarinsky. And it was just so captivating. Um, thank you to Bill Hayes who wrote this book for being that inspiration. And I hope you're sleeping better out there. That's so cool. Thanks for a recommendation. Cause I also love sleep books a lot. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Just so happened to mention into, too that I I uh, although it's not part of my book I you know do you know where I lived when I published that book I was living mm-hmm. on Broad Street in Richmond Virginia oh my gosh that, which exactly is which where is where our exhibit took place actually yep <laughs> yep <laughs> <laughs> literally on Broad Street mm-hmm. all right getting to this is why this is why Julie invited us here yep. today because she is so we should talk about this she is um, every time I post something. She is one of the usually the first person to have liked it. So, so <laughs> we appreciate her, and she's really inspired us to keep going. Um, mm-hmm. I just realized that tomorrow is the second anniversary oh, of the fir- of our first Instagram post, and I posted a little more than two hundred. So it's about you know about two a week, although it's ebbs and flows some weeks I, re- I post a lot then i take a couple some weeks off but trying to keep trying to keep a steady rhythm so um and basically the i mean the reason behind well the reasons behind this are you know when i first started when we first started being serious about the museum of sleep i was still kind of dabbling in sleep so i really wanted to learn a lot so i this was kind of a way for me to open myself up to the world of sleep and particularly how vision, you know, what types of visual representation are out there or have been out there for decades or hundreds of years, really, about sleep. And um, so it was just, it, would, it forced me to think about sleep in the really the broadest term, broadest terms available. Um, and different creative ways of, of expressing sleep, and also you would it would give give us a sense of what was out there already. Especially mm-hmm. if we wanted to, you know, use some of these later on to develop, um, you know, develop uh, exhibits, exhibits either longer, online or in longer person. form experiences. Mm-hmm. So that's that's this is just the current view of our the mm-hmm. Instagram page. Um, so we're just going to go through kind of quickly to see some some highlights. This is one of the oldest images we have, um, and we're starting out with the art, the art of sleep. 
uh, because it has sleep and sleeping people has been they, that's been a topic of artists for for centuries. Well, this... Partly they're easier to draw because they tend to stay still. But what I what I really like about this pillow series by Durer is how dynamic it is. You can really tell that someone has been working on this pillow and moving around with it and. It's well, it's not also a it makes you realize that pillows have been around for a while. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. Wow. Although they're not the only option for under the head, as we will also see. Okay. Um <clears throat> so yeah, so there's um this is more of kind of a class a classical. There's we have a lot of a lot of stuff on Instagram from the you know 19th century, 18th century, 19th century. Um, a lot of portraits of people sleeping, um, particularly women. A lot of the women or mothers with children sleeping. So this is just one example I selected. I was always just I've always really loved this image. Um, as you can see, they took the frame off and um, are exhibiting or online they're exhibiting it without the frame. And I just love the the paint on the you know on the borders and how it how it should, it really gets you a feel for the creative process of of John Lafarge the painter. It also gets you this kind of very intimate look into into who this woman is. She's not kind of presenting a face to the world. This is her in repose and very vulnerable. So there are two series that I did. Um, both of them, I posted five images and I'm showing three today. Um, Edward Hopper, he's just one of my favorite painters, um, always has been. And, you know, you don't, obviously, or not obviously, but uh, you you don't have to look at too many of his paintings before you see a bed or someone sleeping. So I just did a search of, um, you know, all of his bed and sleeping pictures and posted to post, post my favorite ones on Instagram. Um, a thing about this, you know, the one thing that strikes me here is just there, the, you know, Hopper's paintings have that very similar kind of, you know, melancholy feel to most of his work. And this, you really get that same sense of, uh, of them here. His, his beds are very severe and Frankly, they scare me a little bit. <laughs> well, even his most, like the most iconic, is it that night, Nighthawks? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Meaning is, is, I mean, that's at night. It seems like people that aren't able to sleep are sitting in that cafe or. Yeah. Um, so it's interesting to me here that like, these are during the day, you know, that mm -hmm. like they're mm -hmm. so, wow, cool. Now I want to mm -hmm. learn more about, you know, did he have sleep issues? I don't know, hmm. Dwight. I don't know that. You got to wonder. Yeah. Uh, so we, we had seen an exhibit of some Rockwell Kent prints, and I just I didn't I I don't I didn't know that much about them beforehand. But uh, after we came home, I started looking at them more, and also noticed that oh yeah, he painted or not painted. Um, he he did prints of. Um, at least five. Like I say, I included five on Instagram. Just mm -hmm. so just three of them here. Um, and and unlike Hopper, you know, they have very different tones to them. But Jennifer noticed this morning the the composition is very similar in all three. With the the, the sleepers, sleepers are kind of around. dwarfed by the night sky or darkness or nature. There's there's this idea that as as a sleeping creature, you're part of something bigger. Yeah. Back, back to the pillow topic <laughs> or non-pillows. Yeah. Um, I didn't realize until this week that I had actually posted two pictures at various mm -hmm. times of the Egypt, Egyptian headdress. Oh. One more plain one um, and one you know, from King Tut. Um, and every time I look at these, and they're also there, there are kind of Asian headrests mm -hmm. as well. And I think every time I or most Americans look at these, wonder how how the heck did people, you know, use these? To, we we to have sleep. not field tested these. Yeah. But this this is 
something that many people do or did. So then continuing on with the kind of material culture, the things involved with sleep, related to sleep. Oh, this is one of my favorites. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's pretty incredible. <laughs> so yeah, I found this. I was I was doing one of my database searches um, and found, or I was at the Washington State Historical Society's website and their, their database of digital images and found that at, on the left part, that's actually two separate images. Um, so the sleep in your car part was an ad on their website. So that got me curious. Um, so I did a Google search for Carrie Keene coach bed and found another ad of it that was um, uh, for sale on eBay. Um, I redid that search to see if I could find anything new about it. And there's not really. It was the kiss. So Carrie Keene was a company in Iowa, Sioux City, Iowa. And they did these, uh, this was one of their products and from 1925 mm -hmm. to 1937 was when they had their automotive division and then gave that up and switched entirely to um, aircraft, aircraft and various things. Mm -hmm. But so this, I mean, this is just an odd, an odd artifact of, I, I mean, I know that in the thirties, that's, you know, with the, Kind of cross country travel was just was just really starting, um, and people were people were getting in their cars and driving across the country, but didn't always have the money to spend on a motel or a hotel. So uh, this was one of the alternatives. Although I don't, I also don't think this really caught on very well either. But so, do you think they days, actually made the bed? I mean, the car bed? I, I believe, yeah, I believe they did. Um, not um i haven't found any pictures mm -hmm. of the actual all i've seen is ads i can only find ads of it but i think interesting but i believe that they did yeah we, cool. we were talking this morning about it would be really fun to find an actual one mm -hmm. gotta be out there somewhere these these days i think we're much more invested in telling people not to sleep in their car especially when they're driving but this is this is a while ago so um what oh I, I forgot to mention the way the way that I usually find these things is I go mm -hmm. I go into mm -hmm. digital image collections and just usually the first thing I do is just search for sleep and see what comes up. Sometimes I do more targeted searches if I'm looking for a particular person or a particular subject or a sleep disorder or so on. But this one, Life Magazine. They have two databases up online. One is of the photographs and one is of the magazines. This one is from their photograph collection. And this is what, seven images of a series of, uh, I think there were like 15 or so. And I can't find it in the, in the actual magazine to see mm -hmm. how it was displayed. Mm -hmm. But it's this whole series of this woman, this model as she's going to sleep. Um, and some of them are how you know, she's using tools to put her to sleep. So all we can do is guess about that shell is that she's using she's using the sound of the seashell to help put her to sleep, like kind of ambient ambient sound. Otherwise, that makes no sense at all. But that's I just love that picture because it's so strange. It is. Her eyebrows are pretty great. Yeah. Um, and so this is from the newspaper. I love, what I've realized in the past few years is my favorite thing to do is um, to do searches in ar archival newspaper databases, where is one, newspapers.com, I love it. Um, and so what, what I've been doing with these is searching, you know, how, how has sleep, well, sleep science, but also sleep, how has that appeared within in historical newspapers? And so on this one, I think I did a sleep for sleep study or sleep science or sleep science, something like that. And found this really, this, this was a long article. Um, Tribune Girl Reporter holds down dream job. And it's about this uh, reporter from the Chicago Tribune. She went into 
um, this, uh, you know, sleep centers um, and they had a sleep study done. And she wrote a long article. These are the th three of the images that accompanied her article. So I'd like to look at how sleep science has appeared in in the news and the newspaper newspapers and in popular, you know, in the popular imagination when it manages to break through from science into actual culture. Mm -hmm. um, and also, you know, also it gives a good look at how the changing technology pictures of uh, what the, you know, what the sleep center and sleep study technology has, has how that's changed over the years. Mm -hmm. And continuing on with that same thing, but the theme, but uh, this is from uh, the National Archives. There are, um, you know, the... Military military has done a lot of research into into sleep, and so this is a this is one of those. I just this this didn't get many likes when I first posted it, but I was I'm bound and determined to. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I just really love this image, the uh -huh. color of it, and I just think it's a really gorgeous photograph. But also, just I don't know the look on his face and <laughs> here with we the, go with again. The, the electrodes on. <laughs> And like here's Flightman Flightman again because I wanted to include him actually mm -hmm. in action doing our, his doing some early work. Um, and again, this is from Life Life Magazine. This is I think this is from the magazine itself. But I think, yeah, there was an article about him and his research in the magazine. Mm -hmm. And one more time for Kara Kleitman. Um, this was from the a very, very short article, not, not an in-depth like research article, but just kind of a very short one in Science Magazine in 1953. This was like the first public announcement of their research into, into REM sleep. And this was mm -hmm. so this was the first first figure that they included in the article. Mm -hmm. You wanted you can... to explain it. I'll try. Um, it's it's not exactly typical of the tracings we would do in a modern sleep study, but you can see, looking at kind of the body motility channel, this this is somebody who's very still during sleep. You can see the respirations, the breathing is very even, fairly even, but the eye movements in right vertical and right horizontal are jumping, 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 and even as the right frontal, the EEG or brain activity at the bottom is kind of kind of low amplitude, fast frequency, looking kind of awake, but not awake because you would have more movement in the body. Um, this is this is still what we look for overall in looking at REM sleep. I remember finding this article as well and um, just kind mm. of being amazed. And I think someone said it somewhere how mm -hmm. uh, completely unceremonial, like this was uh -huh. really the birth of like, you know, modern sleep medicine and like the discovery yeah. of REM sleep and think of how much we talk about dream sleep and REM sleep in our culture. Mm -hmm. uh, and it just was like this tiny little one or two page article mm -hmm. in science that was like not ex like it wasn't like a big highlight of the year that REM had REM sleep mm -hmm. had been discovered. <laughs> and also, wow, REM sleep wasn't discovered until the 50s. Before that, it was more that you are asleep or awake. Sleep is a thing. No, sleep is a series of things. Sleep is a series of stages and experiences, and they can be very different. And to have discovered that within not my lifetime, but my parents' lifetime, that's pretty amazing. Yeah, I There's like still to say a lot. That, we, yeah. that my, my mom is older than sleep medicine or sleep. <laughs> 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 I mean, there's still a lot we don't know. We don't know that we don't know it yet. Now going to the complete other end of the spectrum. And now for something completely different. I did a search. This was in a comic book database. So I just did a search for sleep. This was the first thing that came up. And I'm afraid I can't tell you any more about this. This was other than the incredible sleep weapon is a nine page, uh, nine page story within this plastic man um, issue. Be but because it's, this one sells for between $150 and $180. 
We have not yet splurged on a copy of it to find out what the incredible sleep weapon is. <laughs> but this it's such a great cover. Please, uh, please to... put your speculation in the comments. <laughs> yeah. So we had to we had to include it. Yeah, like what do what do we think is going on? I don't know, but that's a really big uh weapon, whatever it is. <laughs> yeah. We're so bringing the plastic, out the big guns. The plastic man is the guy in the red in the back. Yep. Yeah. Uh huh. Okay. He stretches. All right, and then so then it's this um this guy with the kind of like yellow eye. I don't know what's going on with him. Yeah. Huh. Hmm. Interesting. All right, I really think we got to find out. Yeah. All right, one of us has to buy has to buy this. I guess. Okay. Um, then, Speaking of random, yeah, this one got a lot of likes when I first posted it, and it's that's all I know about it. Young man sleeping with a manatee. Why I don't know why he's sleeping with a manatee, but um, that's I know it leads to a lot of questions. Um, more questions than answers, really. Yeah. We we have we have long thought about one of one of the first exhibit ideas for Museum of Sleep, thinking in a broader sense, was you know sleep in different animals. You know, what about your dolphins where you're alternating hemispheres and sleep? What about your manatees? I don't know anything about manatees, but they they may do something odd. Um, what about the really, the, the little bug and semi, you know, single, not single cell creatures, but several cell creatures who have periods of quiescence and then periods of activity. At what point does it move into being actual sleep? What defines sleep? Um, lots of very interesting questions. This picture answers none of them, but there is a manatee. Mm -hmm. I was just well. I'm going I know back. that Cly I know that Kleitman did use a lot of dogs and cats um, in his research, mm -hmm. and also for, you know, other scientists have used fruit flies too because of their <clears throat> circadian rhythms. And because frankly, they're very easy to grow and feed. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay. Oh, oh we're, so we're into the photography mm -hmm. section. Uh, this is like our last, or coming up on the end. Um, I did a search in the Harvard Art Museum database, um, and this is a really interesting series uh, by Jack Gould. Uh, there's quite a few of these images. Again, we already mentioned this, but you know, sleeping in public. So this mm -hmm. is, a, I assume, on a train. It looks like a train. Um, and he took a bunch of pictures of people just sleeping on the train. The reason I'm displaying it like this is because on their website, they are they're just displaying the, the left image, the negative image. And then mm -hmm. I reversed the, you know, I I reversed that so it could get a better sense of uh, the image, you know, the image itself. I I find it fascinating that the right hand image after you reverse it looks it's just a little too bright, like, oh my gosh, we've turned the light on on these poor sleepers who really want to be oops left in the darkness here um it's it's such a it's a very personal picture and um again more sleeping in public it looks this looks like a train station to me Ouija the you know famous mostly street photographer he's famous for like crime you know New York crime scenes and street photography um just wanted to include i just love this i love this image i love the <laughs> i love his clothes i love the boots so i just i don't know how to include it and so looking at you know different i don't just this this picture just you know invokes a lot of stuff about you know children but also different different cultures the papoose is you know back to the material culture of sleep and uh, uh the objects that we use the the the, the way we but there's also know. some science behind swaddling and the this really helps children who are thrashing around before sleep to calm down um lots of different cultural implications for sleep and everybody sleeps but not everybody sleeps in the same way with the same accessories 
All right, back to the newspapers. Oh um, my gosh, did we wedge Kleitman in here another time? Yeah, well, I kept wow. one more, one more oh. Kleitman. And Are I, you sure this is the last Kleitman? I believe it is. And th so it's fine, Julie, you mentioned that, yeah, that science article oh. really is sh shockingly small. But and when they presented their paper at the American so Federation of American Societies for Experimental Biology, for some reason, there was an AP reporter there who latched onto it. And so this made it into the newspaper. You know, AP, this is an AP article that went across the country, not very long, um, but um, it was kind of big news. And I just, so I want to include it I include it because of that, but also I just love the, I love the headline, the dreams and the, the dancing eyes. And then another, another search I did, I did a search for in the newspaper database specifically for narcolepsy to see when that word started, started to appear. And this is, uh, I don't know if this is the earliest, but it is one of the earliest ones I found from 1880. And, you know, as, as Jennifer read it this morning, realized it's not really, it's not narcolepsy in the contemporary sense of how we use it. Not, not necessarily. Um, you know, thinking about, thinking about the second case, somebody who was very obese, who could fall asleep very quickly, could that be narcolepsy as we know it now? It could be. It could also be Pickwickian syndrome, which is if you are excessively obese and you are not breathing well during the night, you may fall asleep very quickly during the day, which is less of a neurologic condition and more of a more of a breathing problem. Um, we are not the experts in narcolepsy. We have someone else here who is though, so. <laughs> no, I, I mean, I think that's so true though. Often people think that just because you fall asleep quickly means mm -hmm. that means that you have narcolepsy. Um, right, which is usually, not necessarily the case. Right, usually I kind of have to try to, you know, um, uh, rewind that a little bit for people to mm -hmm. realize that there are different reasons uh, for hypersomnias, um, which actually I think is really interesting about some of the images uh, that you've shown, because one of the things I've learned um, just looking at culture and movies is that mm. narcolepsy has been displayed as if something that you could uh, in rat race, a particular movie in 1999, mm. um, the character, Mr. Bean, you know, that guy, uh, Rowan Atkinson, mm -hmm. He fall he falls asleep while standing uh mm -hmm. in you know a busy um Vegas you know hotel lobby mm -hmm. and and he's supposedly standing uh with nothing against him he's not leaning on anything uh and he's sleeping and and he does mm -hmm. it for a while and some of the interesting things I learned was that like humans actually really can't stand very long while sleeping like your body kind of gives out you can maybe nod mm -hmm. off for a quick second. Um, but even like when you were showing that cowboy, um, I started thinking about so much is we're leaning on something. You're either laying mm -hmm. down or you're leaning um, mm -hmm. and it, you don't really see images the same way. So it's, it, it's uh, some particular animals like horses, they can't actually nap while standing because they have a special like lock apparatus mm -hmm. in their Ooh. knee to help them stay cool. standing while they nap. They can't fully go through a whole night of sleep, but they can at least nap while standing and, and flamingos. Mm -hmm. They do a cool thing where they balance. So anyway, um, it just, I, I kind of like, even like the idea of an exhibit about leaning into sleep, mm, mm -hmm. you know, um, because it's not, that it's, would be fun. Yeah. Yeah. Cause the movies have made it seem as if it's just something that's so strange. Cause who actually mm -hmm. does that? No one. So that's why I didn't think I could have narcolepsy. Cause I wasn't falling asleep while I was standing in the middle of the day, uh, uh -huh, you know? Uh -huh. so. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Huh. All right, I think this is our last image. Um, Pretty mm, second to last. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. um, I'm re really interested in the Andy, Andy Warhol film. It's one of his first films, one of his first long film, uh, Sleep, which is you know six hours of poet John Cherno sleeping. Um, we've been struggling for years to figure out the best way to have a presentation of that, a screening of it. But I've done a lot of reading on it. So I looked up a review of it from the time, from the time it was released, found this really, found this great review of it from film culture. So I, I posted the entire review in the in the comment section on Instagram, but could not help myself to just to screenshot how he finished it because, because we like sleep. <laughs> so, we do. So trying to, this is kind of an iconic 
iconic image for our audience, mm -hmm. our audiences. We like sleep. We hope you do too. Mm -hmm. We did want to include our contact information. So people who have comments, requests, want to send art or other things this way, please, please do get in touch. I, I think we're kind of interested in figuring out how to make this work, not, not only as an Instagram feed, which Dwight has worked very hard on, but also in the future as a museum and kind of collective enterprise of getting fascinating and illuminating information about sleep out into the world as as somebody who sometimes practices sleep medicine um yep we spend a lot of time talking about sleep hygiene and that's all very good and there's you know it's it's a small sample of things to say about sleep there's much more art and poetry and science and illumination in the world of sleep yeah so please contact us we're, we're really interested in in collaborations with all, all sorts of different individuals and organizations. And if I can mention, we're really happy to be here with you today. I'm gonna to stop sharing. Yes, thank you guys so, so much. Um, this has just been uh, incredible. Let me see if I can put our view so we can see both of us. There we go. Mm -hmm. um, so we do have one comment here on Facebook. Someone say, oh, there's the, there's the bed of wear. A very tiny bit of wear. That is the so picture cool. is one thing, but to have the actual, yep. <laughs> um, and so we have a comment here. It says, "You guys have some really great artifacts. I'd love to hear more about your thoughts or plans for opening a physical museum. I've been thinking a lot about what that could look like since I mm -hmm. heard about this talk. And that's mm -hmm. from that's from the sleep doctor in the D.C. area. Okay. Okay." Dear. <laughs> um, yeah, well, first of all, we have not yet created a 501c3. We need that's been that was on my to do list for last year and I got kind of lackadaisical about it. So um, that would be a first step um, is to start to start a nonprofit, get get an advisory board and start start finding the people to mm -hmm. talk to and come up with a plan. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I'm, we're constantly thinking about ways to make something happen. I, I think maybe the next, well, we've got ideas for events and activities, but maybe starting with a, like a pop-up museum. So, you know, like I say, we're based, we're based basically in, in Richmond or just outside of Richmond. This may, may or may not be the best place for it. It'd be the most convenient for us, but there are probably better locations. So I don't know, I, I can see us doing like a pop-up exhibit mm -hmm. somewhere or, or either around here or somewhere nearby. Correct me if I'm wrong. Have we talked in the past about curating something like a traveling exhibit, something that could go to different museums out in the world? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The traveling museum of sleep. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, I also, have you guys done any of those like kind of like Instagram uh, pop-ups where they have, mm -hmm. um, it's the whole thing is pretty much like uh, experiences sort of, and you photograph oh. it? Mm -hmm. Dear, mm -hmm. Nope. No. Nope. We got to look at that now. Yeah. Um, they're fun. Uh, I was just trying to think if there could be, because that's what I think of when you say like a pop-up. Um mm -hmm is that it's kind of like a fun experience in different rooms with really cool colors and, you know, different mm. things. But uh, I don't know about sleep in that. Uh, but I mean, it's just, it's just so fun to think about all the different ways. There are so many different ways. There's so much opportunity yeah. here. So I, I mean, I think the museum should be right on the national mall. I don't know about you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm okay with that. Where would you put it there? Damn it between the, but yeah, I mean, we've also, I mean, another idea that we've had is including the sleep experience and like mm. somehow getting nap pods. Yeah, getting nap pods. Cause I mean, a lot of museums have had those, you know, you can come spend the night in the museum. Um, actually, the Richmond, the, the, the VMFA, the Virginia mm -hmm. Museum of Fine Art, they had an Edward Hopper exhibit few years ago and they so they built this room based on one of his one of his bed paintings and so people could if you paid you could come and sleep in the bed and spend the night in in that you know in that version of the painting within the museum so we did not do that yeah yeah 
So I'm not sure why you didn't do that. So yeah, so there is a there's already this history of uh, museums, people sleeping in museums. So we'd like to just kind of switch it around and make sleep the focus of the but but yeah, having people be able to come and fall asleep in the museum. I love it. Well, people are just loving it. Um, people are excited to get in touch with you and saying you may have some future board members right on here today. Cool. Um, so, you know, really excited um, to see what happens next. And we'll have to check back in with you guys um, to hear what's happening uh, in the coming years, because I know I'm your biggest super fan and I'm just glad to hopefully help to expand your um, super fan club. Um, because I think what you're doing is just so important and such a unique contribution to this space. Uh, and I'm just so grateful. And I think you guys are a killer combo. Uh, I think you should probably have some sort of a podcast or a NPR show or something, because I love I love the back and forth and both of your perspectives is just um, really, really awesome. So <laughs> um, thank you so much for having us. And we're so happy to be participating in Sleep In in a small way. Yes, of course. We're so grateful. And uh, thank you for putting together the slides and sharing some of the highlights. Um, so everybody, you know, we have the links here in our um, chat to go check out more of the Instagram and to get in touch with um, Dwight and Jennifer. So with that, I think everyone have a wonderful Sunday and please do not forget to join us tonight. We actually have, I know, tuned in right here. Uh, Dr. Uh, Jenny Talbert will be doing a really great uh, evening stretch session via Instagram tonight. Um, Jenny is a chiropractor and a person living um, with uh, sleep apnea, and uh, she'll also go over some pillow positioning uh, for sleep. So we're really excited to have Jennifer kind of close out the sleep in tonight with some evening stretch, which I think is just the perfect way to end the weekend. So um, that's going to be at 9 p.m. Eastern, I mm -hmm. believe. So join us for that on Instagram and everyone have a wonderful Sunday. And thank you again, Jennifer and Dwight. You're welcome. Hey. And thank you, Julie. All right. Bye for now. Bye-bye.